we start, I'd just like to ask you guys as producers to think back on some of the decisions that you've made over the last three financial years um, and how you feel about what the outcomes of those decisions have been. Um, so I'm a farm business analyst at AgriPath um, and prior to that I was working with Tees Australia, uh, primarily based at their condomine feedlot. Um, in a number of different roles as part of a graduate management program uh, and finished up there as livestock supervisor. Um, in my current role with AgriPath, I work with farm businesses analysing farm, farm performance data, uh, developing budgets and essentially running the numbers on different scenarios as they come up. AgriPath uh, delivers business and technical management services to our clients. Um, who are based from up in central Queensland down into Victoria. We currently work with over 250 businesses, um, primarily livestock, um, dryland farming and irrigated farming businesses and covering a total area of 2.1 million hectares. Um, in 2019, our livestock data set comprised of over 150 businesses covering oh, sorry, with an average farm area of 5,700 hectares and an average asset value of 10.7 million. So our focus as a business is really around linking farm financial and physical performance data um, in a way that allows our clients to make more informed business decisions. Um, so that's Dale's point around the benchmarking. Essentially, all our clients participate in um, annual comparative analysis where we look at how their businesses have performed compared to their peers um, in the same region and doing the same things as them. Um, what I really love about the job is doing the numbers on different scenarios and either validating what seems like the best decision or realising that we actually need to be doing something differently. So today I'm going to share some of the key factors that we have seen influence cattle gross margins from our Northern Tablelands and Northwest Slopes data sets over the last three financial years. Um, so for those of you who are already doing some or all of these, that's fantastic and this will validate what you're currently doing. Um, and if you can take something away from this presentation that's going to change what you do or what you'll consider going forwards and the next time around, that's even better. Um, so these key factors are around feeding and controlling our feed costs, managing the body condition score of our breeding herd, early weaning and fetal ageing and partitioning our herd into early and late carvers. I'm sure it won't surprise anyone here today to hear that feed costs have been a significant factor influencing gross margins over the last three years. Um, at AgriPath we define feed costs as those associated with managing sorry, um, maintaining pasture, um, growing and grazing fodder crops, adjustment and purchasing um, fodder such as grain, hay and other supplements. Um, and that includes if you produce feed on farm, so if you go and cut hay and stick that in the shed to feed to your cattle, we put a value on that as well. Um, so this graph shows the relationship between feed costs and gross margins for cattle breeding operations between 2018 and 2020 financial year. Um, on the y-axis we've got gross margin, dollars per DSE, and across the bottom we've got feed costs, dollars per DSE. So each one of these dots represents a cattle gross margin for a given year between 2018 and 2020 financial year. Um, this business, for example, um, that represents, well, this is zero um, and you can see that breeding gross margins have been significantly affected over that time period. Um, that business, for example, has returned a negative gross margin of $50 a DSE um, and had feed costs of around $15 a DSE. Um, in 2020 financial year, we saw a negative correlation of 42% between feed costs and gross margin per DSE. And in, oh, that was 29. And 2020, we saw a 59% um, correlation. So essentially, the higher a business's 
feed costs were per DSE, the lower their gross margin tended to be. Um, we didn't observe the same trend for trading operations because some traders that were feeding for production weight gain rather than maintenance um, were able to achieve a higher gross margin per DSE despite their higher feed costs. Um, so how, mu how much businesses spent per DSE was impacted by two factors and that was what they chose to feed and how they chose to feed it. Um, businesses that had the capacity to feed grain um, tended to have lower feed costs because they could supplement that with lower quality hay and straw, um, whereas those businesses that didn't have that capacity had to feed higher quality, higher quality hay um, to meet the nutritional requirements of their herds. Um, for 2020 financial year, the top 20% of uh, breeding operations on a gross margin per DSE basis spent an average of $3 a DSE on grain, which was slightly below the average of $4 a DSE across the group. The bottom 20% of performers didn't feed any grain. Um, for the same year, the top 20% spent an average of $11 a DSE on hay, which was half of what the average spent and a fifth of what the bottom 20% spent. So essentially your top performers were feeding grain and supplementing that with um, lower quality hay and straw, and while your bottom performers tended to be those producers that didn't have that capacity and had to spend a lot more on higher quality hay. The other factor that influenced how much businesses were spending on feed costs was how they chose to feed. Um, so by that I mean whether they were feeding in a measured way or providing feed ad-lib to their stock. Um, Businesses that were feeding in a measured way we found had much lower feeding costs. Um, and by way of example, we had one producer that was feeding wieners on two different properties. Uh, in one, they were feeding in a measured way, so a, a calculated amount every second day. And on the other property, they had the same ration, but provided ad lib. Um, so no differences in ration. The only difference between the two properties was the method that they were using to feed. Um, and they observed dollars per kilo cost of gain, um, a 34% higher cost of gain on the property where they were feeding ad lib. So the, efficiency, the efficiencies there in terms of reduced wastage and um, improved animal performance through a more consistent and measured feed intake um, are more significant than you might imagine. Um, and the setup to do that doesn't necessarily need to be really flash. Having a surface to feed onto so that you're minimising, you know, your stock walking through your hay and getting wastages that way. Um, having adequate storage to make sure you're minimising losses through spoilage. Um, and the location of your stock. So holding your stock close to where you're storing your feed and where you're preparing your ration. And that probably seems like a pretty simple or silly one. Um, but the time efficiencies are actually really significant and can be the difference between spending a morning feeding versus spending a whole day on feeding. And over a prolonged period of time, that really does add up um, when you think about the wages, the fuel and the time that you're dedicating to that. Um, having the right setup for feeding also bears relevance to the next factor which is managing your breeder body condition score. Um, so this is essentially about balancing animal performance with financial performance. Um, as body condition score increases, we typically see higher conception rates, which is usually a good thing. Um, but in a, in a season where we're providing most, if not all, the nutritional requirements for those animals, Maximised animal performance doesn't necessarily equate to maximised financial performance. Um, so in these years, we're really looking for a body condition score of 3 to 3.5 um, because that's where you're going to get the best bang for buck in terms of what you're putting into that animal for nu nutritional requirements versus the conception rates you can expect, which are around that 70 to 80%. Um, it can be tough to manage, and we did see producers at both ends of the spectrum. So 
we saw producers that had their body condition score average fall below a three, resulting in conception rates as low as 45%. Um, and at the other end, we saw producers that probably had their breeders in better condition than they needed to be, so up around that four or four and a half body condition score. Um, the argument for a lot of these producers that had their cattle in better condition was that they really wanted to make sure that they had good conception rates. Um, in these cases, it really becomes a question of how much are those additional calves worth. Um, so if we just look at these two businesses as an example. So these, um, they're two real businesses. We'll just call them Farm A and Farm B um, for now. Um, so Farm A uh, had about 550 breeders and they were maintained at an average body condition score of 3, three to 3.5. Um, whereas Farm B had about 450 breeders and they maintained them at a body condition score of 4 to 4.5. Farm A was feeding in a measured way. Um, they're feeding grain and low quality hay, and their feed costs came to $43 a DSE. That equates to about, well, just below 800 bucks a breeder. Um, farm B was feeding ad lib. They were feeding high quality hay and cottonseed, and their feed costs were essentially double what Farm A's were per DSE. Um, that equates to um, feed cost per breeder of over $1,300 a head. Um, they, had their, they had their cows in better conditions, so they did get um, a higher PTIC preg testing rate, 91% um, compared to 80. So that, that equates to 11% higher PTIC rate, and on a herd of 437 breeders, that equates to 40 extra weaners, um, which sounds pretty good, um, but they spent $1,300 a breeder compared to Farm A's $800 a breeder. Over the cost of, over the size of their herd, in total dollar terms, that equates to $250,000 um, for those 48 breeders. So they spent an additional $250,000 to get those 48 breeders, 48 weaners. That equates to $5,200 a head. So how much are those additional calves really worth? Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, it is worth noting that Farm A fed in a measured way. Um, so feeding in a measured way makes it easier to manage your body condition score of your breeders because you know how much they're consuming um, and you can adjust that accordingly. So the next key factor has been around early weaning. Um, this is really about using early weaning as a tool to reduce the overall energy requirements of your herd. Um, so in terms of energy requirements, it's more efficient to be maintaining um, a cow and calf as two separate units compared to a cow with, say, a three-month-old calf at foot. Um, and that's because it becomes increasingly inefficient to be feeding nutrients to a cow who's then converting that into milk and trying to meet the energy requirements of her calf. Um, studies have reported conversion efficiencies of up to 43% in early weaning mobs compared to conventionally weaned mobs. Over the last three years, we've seen producers successfully weaning down to 70 or 100 kilos, um, and we've seen reduced feed costs associated with early weaning. It's certainly something that we do see our top performers doing. Um, one of the top performers in 2020 financial year actually went out and bought a thousand extra calves, or all around that 100 kilos, to feed along with their own weaners. Um, I think he just thought, uh, if I'm feeding 500 head, I must, might as well be feeding 1500. Um, and he did really well. He was had the second top gross margin for the year. Um, so as long as we're making sure we've got the right ration to be meeting the nutritional requirements of those animals, that we're partitioning by weight. Um, and monitoring adequately to ensure you're picking up any individuals that aren't performing. Early weaning is definitely a tool that we hope more producers will be using in dry conditions going forwards. So the final uh, key factor that we've found influencing cattle gross margins 
is the ability to partition your herd into early and late calving mobs. So if you can get your vet or your technician to preg test early and fetal age, you're able to partition your herd into early and late calving mobs. And this is really about building levers into your business. So options around, um, say, retaining your late calvers and the other way around. Options around retaining your early car retaining your early carvers and selling your late carvers PTIC or carving down in two mobs um, to make the logistics around early weaning easier, so you know, tighter weight ranges. Um, or say if if you're further down the line when you realise you need to um, reduce your energy requirements on your property, um, you might be looking at selling your early carvers with calves at foot because you know that the last the last one's two months old and you know that there's no more coming in that mob. Um, so it's really about building these levers into your business that you can pull at different times to give yourself more choices and um, you know more flexibility. Um, so they're the, they're the key factors that we saw influence cattle gross margins in our Northern Tablelands and Northwest Slopes and Plains data sets over the last three financial years. So in terms of feeding, you've got your ration mix, whether you're feeding grain and low quality hay to supplement that, um, whether you're feeding in a measured manner or ad lib, um, how you're managing your breeder body condition score, whether you're using um, early weaning as a tool to reduce the overall energy requirements of your herd, um, and whether you're partitioning your herd into an early and late calving mob to give yourself those extra levers. So a question that we're always asked is, um, am I better off to sell down or am, am I better off to hold my stock and feed through? And I can tell you that in 2020 financial year, our top 20% performers comprised of both businesses that held and fed and businesses that sold down. So returns were dependent on how businesses executed their chosen strategy as opposed to whether or not they destocked. And how businesses approached the factors that I've spoken about today contributed to how well they executed their chosen strategy and consequently on their returns over the last three financial years. So I'd like to ask you guys, what are your key learnings from that period? What will you keep doing? What will you start doing? What will you stop doing? Because it's really important that we build those um, key learnings into what we do going forwards so that we've got more resilient businesses that have the capability to withstand those drier, hotter years when they come. Thank you.